So I, I usually start my talks with this one slide just because I think every talk I've given in the last 15 years, and I got this from one of my former chairs, just to get us understanding what agriculture is all about. This is an agricultural uh, meeting. You know, what we do in agriculture, we try to maximize photosynthetic capture energy from the sun and make it a harvestable product. So everything we do, irrigation, uh, hybrids, uh, fertilizer, all these things are meant to maximize that and do it in a sustainable way so that our children and grandchildren can continue to have that benefit of that harvest. So just, I, I, I go to Africa quite a bit and uh, I even tell the farmers this and I say, you know what, you're an engineer of harvesting energy. You're a harvest, you're energy harvester engineer and they kind of get really think that's pretty cool, you know, so. Uh, history of no-tillage, you know, no-tillage is really the oldest type of agriculture that we know. Uh, before we had uh, production of equipment, tillage equipment and animal power and then mechanical power, the way that they would grow crops is stick, make a hole in the ground with a stick, plant the seed, cover it up and then harvest whatever you can could from that. And that's still going on today in some parts. This is a picture from Peru, slash and burn. They cut down the jungle, they burn it. You can tell it'd be pretty difficult to till that field, right? So they go in there and they just, with a stick, put a hole in the ground, plant their crop, and then harvest whatever they can. But with the development of mechanical equipment, the, till, the plow, the tillage equipment, Agriculture became synonymous with tillage. And it was like, how can you ever grow a crop if you don't till first? That's impossible. So even back in the, this is from a hieroglyphic from Egyptian pyramid, it's on the cover of Soil and Tillage Research. It's a picture of two oxen, oxen pulling a plow. So agriculture and tillage were kind of synonymous for many, many years, thousands of years actually. and. Um, so I actually taught, I wrote a paper with Dr. Coleman and I said agriculture could be divided up into three eras, the mechanical era, and then around World War II we came to the chemical era, fertilizers and pesticides, and I think today we're really moving strongly into the biological era. Uh, but this was for many years the mechanical era. But in 1943 this book came out called Plowman's Folly, oh, and actually I have the book upstairs, I was going to show it to you, but that's okay. Um, this Edward Faulkner was an uh, extension agent here in Ohio and he wrote this. This is on the cover of the flyleaf of the book and this was talking about radical statement in 1943. He said, Plowman's Folly is perhaps the most important challenge to agricultural theory yet advanced in this country. Its new philosophy of the soil based on proven principles is completely opposed to established concepts and may revolutionize the entire practice of cultivation in the United States. This book, says Mr. Faulkner, sets out to show that the moldboard plow is the least satisfactory implement for the production of crops. Wow. I think there were some people that weren't quite in agreement with that in 1943. The fact is, no one has ever advanced the scientific reason for plowing. And actually, inside the book, he gets a little stronger than that. He says, no university professor has ever advanced a good reason for using the plow for crop production. So this was a pretty radical statement in 1943, but I think it began people to think, maybe we can grow a crop with less tillage. So what is no tillage? And of course you all know that it's zero tillage. It's a farming system which the seeds are directly planted into the ground without any tillage at all right into the previous crop residues. You need special equipment and the aim, and we just heard several talks, Dr. Diker talked about minimizing the soil disturbance as much as possible when we do that. Uh, and one of the things I've found in my research over the years, even a little bit of soil disturbance goes a long way to overcoming years of no tillage or cult uh, conservation tillage. And Rolf Derps from uh, South America has been very active in this whole area of no-tillage. So of course, the, one of the major impetuses for developing no-tillage was 
to decrease soil erosion. Uh, Iowa State uh, Rick Cruz says in Iowa, an uh, average of 5.5 ton per acre per year of soil has been lost in the state of Ohio over the century. So he was saying, I think something like five to six inches of topsoil has been lost. And so that's been one of the major reasons why I think uh, conservation tillage all the way to no tillage uh, has developed. So these are the two pioneers. Uh, and we claim them from Ohio. They were in Worcester, Dr. Glover Triplett on the left, Dr. Dave Van Dorn on the right. Dave Van Dorn passed away a few years ago. Uh, he retired to near Lodi between Worcester and Columbus. Glover Triplett retired about the time I started my work in 1980, moved to Mississippi, where he worked for Mississippi State University, I think for 17 years, and pioneered no-till cotton. So he has had a huge impact on agriculture around the world. And he and I wrote an article that was published in the 100th year anniversary of Agronomy Journal called No Tillage, A Revolution in Agriculture, because it really has revolutionized agriculture. I called him up in preparation of this talk. We still talk back and forth periodically just to make sure of my facts and get some in input from him. He's 93 years old. He's still as sharp as a tack. He always calls me every fall. I haven't gotten this much recently, but he used to call me every fall, want to know what the yields were on those long-term plots. He was really interested in that. But I have to say one other thing, because he and I talked about that. Recently, I read an article that said no tillage, the first no tillage seed was put in the ground in Kentucky. And if there's anybody from Kentucky here, I hate to burst your bubble. But I actually pulled up some publications from Ohio State University that preceded 1960, and they said in 1962. So I forgot that part. But we have publications from Ohio State University that preceded uh, 1962 as far as early no tillage work. And in fact, he said also Virginia Tech, some of the researchers at Virginia Tech, very early on in the late 50s, early 60s, they would take a soil core into a sod field or a sod plot, pull out a plug of the sod, put in the corn seed, put the sod back in to, you know, as a kind of a soil cover, I guess, and then spray it with atrazine. And that was like the, the very first no-till that he could really think about uh, back then. Uh, so these plots started in 1950, uh, 1962, so now we are 58 years behind us in Worcester. 58 years never seen a plow on some of these plots. Originally, well, I'll get to. So these were dedicated. I developed an a endowment for those, and Dr. Coleman has kept that up to try to maintain those plots. Uh, they, I don't know how many tours I've given over in those plots over the years, but it's been a lot. Uh, so these are, uh, there were three sites, 62, 63. South Charleston was in 64, but I usually don't talk much about that because it doesn't have a rotation. But the other two plots have both tillage and a rotation as part of the experimental design. So Worcester is a Worcester silt loam. Hoytville is a silty clay loam. They're different. The, the Hoytville soil is heavier, more clay, so it acts very different way. It responds different way to tillage and rotation. Uh, Well-drained and poorly drained. Uh, experiments, uh, management. So these are, this is the experimental design. There's a plow tillage, which has been maintained. There's a no tillage at the bottom where there's been no tillage at all other than the planting of the seed. And then the middle one, I have chisel tillage. Initially in the first years, it was a plow plant. And I don't know, I think Michigan State, they were doing that uh, originally also. But they would plow it and then do no secondary tillage and then just plant directly into the plowed field. So that was kind of the intermediate tillage at that time. We've changed it to chisel tillage back in the early 80s, I think it was. And then we had three rotation, uh, continuous corn, corn, soybean, corn, oats, metal. And basically when they set this up, they were looking at corn every year corn every other year, or corn every third year. That's the reason why they set it up that way. And so you'll see that uh, come back. And their original questions were interesting. And, and talking to Dr. Glover Triplett, and I've published this in some bulletins and seen it in some bulletins, they were asking these basically three questions, and the fourth one is just, how do you manage it? But one of the questions was, 
1962, how much tillage, if any, is needed to grow a crop? In 1962, that was an open-ended question. Can you even grow a crop without plowing? Because agriculture and plowing went together for thousands of years. How could you separate those two? And then the second question, how do tillage and rotation interact to influence yields of corn? Corn every year, every other year, every third year, and then the tillage uh, variable. And how do they interact? What effect does soil type have when tillage is reduced? So we have the, the heavier clay soils in northwest Ohio and the lighter soil silt soils in Worcester. And then, of course, I didn't do anything. It just changed. Uh, but then, then, of course, how to manage those systems. So what I've done is I've just looked at the early years because I just wanted to focus on those because I think Dr. Coleman will give us a more complete set of data uh, later on. But this is just averaging all the, the rotations but looking at the direct effect of tillage, plow tillage, the chisel tillage, and the no tillage. So you see at Hoytville, no tillage in those early years always gave us consistently a yield penalty. And sometimes it was quite large uh, penalty. And so in the early years when people were starting to do, do no tillage, the recommendation for many of the extension, uh, university extension services was no tillage works in your lighter soils, but don't try it in your heavier soils. It's not going to work. And this is some of the data that they used uh, to show that. Worcester on the other uh, side of this, or in opposition of that, no tillage was beneficial from the very beginning. We got good yield responses to no tillage from the very first years we started this. And these are actually five years running averages. So 1962 actually is the average of 62, 63, 64, 65, 66. So five years and then 65 was the next five year running average just to smooth it out a little bit. So. Those early years, definitely at Hoytville, we took a yield penalty. But I think he will show you in these later years that's not so much the case. Something happened when we continued to do no tillage on these heavier clay soils that changed and got rid of that yield penalty uh, that was found on those heavier soils. OK, and here's just uh, looking at the rotation effect. Uh, so continuous corn, corn every year, corn every other year, corn every third year. And of course, in basic agronomy, we always say rotation is good to keep your yields high. So that's what we see. Uh, the three, every three years, the corn yields are always higher. But again, at Hoytville, it's that heavy clay soil with continuous corn that gave us the greatest, biggest yield penalty. So if we rotate it, corn with soybean or something else, even a two-year rotation, we could get rid of a lot of that yield penalty that was associated with no tillage. So there was an interaction between tillage and rotation on this heavier soil. What time am I supposed to be done? 11.20? OK, because I can get long-winded sometimes. Uh, I looked at some of the just really basic um, Climatic weather data, I should probably say, on these long-term yield averages on these two sites. And wherever you have a lot of stars, that's where it seemed to, those were the most effective in, in a, a controlling yield, the final yield. So you see at Worcester, it was the July temperature that really seemed to control or uh, affect the final yield of corn more than some of the other variables we looked at. And it was always negative. So the higher the July, average July temperature, the lower the yield uh, on those crops. At Hoytville, you see most of the stars are where? The August temperature. I don't know why that different. Maybe they plant a little later, so delayed uh, the response. But it's the August temperature that seemed to have the greatest effect on final yield. And again, it was negative. The higher the, the August temperature, average, uh, average August temperature, the lower the final yield. <clears throat> 
So conclusions from that part was the corn yield under all tillage systems at both sites increased with time. However, how the yield responded to tillage changed over time and the changes were not consistent. Growing corn one year out of three increased yields while two year rotation affected corn yields much less. July rainfall, July temperature and August temperature could account for 40 to 55% of the total yield variation at both Worcester and Hoytville. Yield of corn at Worcester seemed to be most sensitive <coughs> negatively to July temperature and yields at Hoytville seem to be most sensitive negatively to August temperature. So that's kind of some of the summary of what we found from these long-term plots, uh, just in a really broad stroke uh, showing results. But then I, I want to look at some other things that uh, we did on these plots. I think at one time we showed 76 publications that derive from these plots is probably closer to 100 now. So whenever you change a new, impose a new management system on a, in a field, you usually have a very rapid change to where you eventually come to the new equilibrium. And if you just look at the average rate, it really doesn't tell you what happens in real life. So you'll get this rapid change initially and then it'll slow down as you, uh, approach the new equilibrium. So how, well, how does that affect what we see on these long-term plots? Because where else are you going to find no-till plots 58 years? Very few places in this world. In fact, I always say it's, they're the longest continuously maintained no-tillage plots in the world. And I don't think I've been challenged yet about that. So let's look at organic carbon concentration. Started in 1962, I came in 1980 and I did some very detailed sampling back in 1980. So we look at the organic carbon concentrations uh, with time. Uh, this was after 18 year, uh, 17 years at Hoytville. So you see in 1980, the uh, organic carbon was much higher at the surface, but then we had some reductions at depth. So when people talk about carbon sequestration and this whole thing about climate change, and people talk about, well, you should go to less tillage, all the way to no tillage because you can actually do, conserve carbon, sequester carbon. And they would say, oh, wait a minute, look at, we see this type of data. Accumulate on the surface but decrease it in the subsurface. So are you really accumulating carbon in your soils compared to what it was before? Well, maybe it takes a while, but let's look after 36 years. Definitely we are conserving carbon, building carbon, taking carbon dioxide out of the air, putting it in the soil where it can do a lot of good things. Definitely showing that. That's in 19, 1996. I think uh, I have some for Worcester a little later, but probably we should really do this very detailed study again and just see uh, what we see. Uh, this is at Worcester, again, 1980. In this case, we were building carbon at the surface, but we weren't losing it in the subsurface so much. 1993, we went from two and a half at the surface to over three. And in 2003, we almost hit 4%. Definitely taking carbon dioxide out of the air, putting it in the soil. So how much is a ton of carbon worth? That's one thing that people are talking about. Maybe you should be paid for putting carbon in the soil. And how much should that amount be? Some of the international climate treaties are talking about this part of that whole equation as far as climate change, using agriculture as a sink for carbon. So this is just at the surface showing over time. This does go up to 2005, 1962. You see how uh, at the surface there's a little decline with plow till, but definitely increase with no-till. And at Worcester, that, that difference, see the difference between those two even greater. And of course, most of that is because when we continually add organic matter, we're not tilling. Tilling is like taking in your fireplace and stirring up the embers in your fireplace, introducing oxygen, you get a much rapid more burn. So what you're really doing every time you till your soil is you're stimulating a slow burn of the carbon. And so in this case, we have what's called physically protected organic matter. 
It's protected in a pore where the bacteria can't get to it as easily. We also have what's called chemically protected carbon, which is just a very humified carbon that's quite resistant to microbial attack and breakdown. We did this, we dug down to a foot in our no-till soils and in our plow tail. I'm just showing the no-till because the plow tail, you didn't see hardly a single hole. But whenever an earthworm creates a hole in a no-till field, it will stay there for years and years and years. Those, some of these holes, we've, we have some other data uh, that show some of these were existing for 10, 15 years. They're probably still there 10, 15 years from when this picture was taken. And again, Dr. Dyker talked a lot about when you have these holes, you have much better infiltration and aeration of your soil. Uh, people talked about soil density being a problem early on in the no-tillage work. So that was one of the concerns early on when this no-tillage research started. But what we have found is the density of our no-tillage soil is actually many times, when we measure now in these long-term plots, less than where we plow. And now there, it's, the soil is firmer, but because it has so many more voids, soil density is just vo uh, dense, uh, mass divided by volume. So we have less, because of all the voids, we have less soil mass in a volume, which gives us less soil uh, bulk density, but it's a, just a much firmer soil. It just holds up better under traffic and those sorts of things. And I have some pictures very similar to what you have, showing we were sampling with a, a sampler and we hung up our sampler in the plow till plots and it did very well in the no-till plots. We hardly saw any tracks at all. So very different uh, responses. Now this is another thing we found and uh, Certainly, no-tillage has done a tremendous amount in reducing erosion, and when you have erosion, you have a, a movement of a lot of phosphorus, and so when cutting down the erosion, we have significantly reduced the amount of phosphorus going into our lakes, but one thing that it has increased is the amount of available P that gets in our water, our soluble P. So this was in the very top half inch, which is what the rainfall will interact with, so you see the total amount of phosphorus in our 12-inch layer wasn't that much different. But the amount of available P or soluble P in that very surface layer, right at the surface, is seven times greater. So every time it rains, it will release some of that into the water and uh, can move it off the field. So what do we do about that? It's just a fact of life. Uh, so we have come up with some things in the last few years, of course, the hypoxia issue. Uh, we've been working with gypsum, uh, calcium sulfate on some of these no-till soils in Ohio. And it's calcium sulfate. The calcium will react with this soluble P, make calcium phosphate, keeps it on the soil, but it's still available to plants. So if you do a Bray test, uh, uh, Malik test, I should say, it really doesn't change the needle as far as what we measure is available. So we did a study started in April of 2012 in Northwest Ohio, one ton per acre on different farms. And of course, 2012 was a very dry year. So we were gonna take samples all summer. We didn't get any samples the whole summer. And then, in the fall, it started to rain, and the soils began to get saturated. And then in December and January, December 2012, January 2013, I started getting these emails from our collaborators. And this is one from one of our farm collaborators. He said, Warren, you can't believe what I just saw in my field that we were working with you on. So here's a no gypsum tile. This is a gypsum tile. You can see the, the bottles. Uh, I don't need a fancy spectrophotometer to see there's a difference. You can see it with your naked eye. Another farmer, this was in January in the same study, said, Warren, you can't believe what we saw. And he showed, he sent us this picture. This was 20 months after application. You could still see the treatment effect. So I think this is this last slide, or maybe one after this yet. 43, we had 43 total sampling events in this study. We did another study after this with USDA, showed similar results. 
uh, through May 2012 through April 2014. Uh, that P reduction in tile drainage lasted at least 20 months. Reductions in, in concentrations for individual gypsum treated areas varied from 0 to 69%. Average reductions for all gypsum treated areas combined was 37%. I think the state target is 40%, so we almost reached it just with this one ton per acre treatment. Uh, with a median redu reduction of 46% in a range from 0 to 93%. And P concentrations in drainage water for individual sampling events range from 0.01 to 0.11 in gypsum treated areas and from 0.01 to 0.43 in areas without gypsum. So big difference. Uh, I'm going to, you know, problems and we're still working on some of those, you know, we have to have a reason. This is slow in responding. We need to have a reason to keep doing our research and of course there's a lot of reasons there uh, that we can still look at when we do uh, tillage research. Of course, some of the benefits, and uh, I think this carbon thing, not only carbon dioxide, but we've done studies with methane. The longer you do no tillage, your soil becomes like a forest soil. And forest soil have certain organisms that take methane out of the air naturally, reduce the methane, and so there's another uh, climatic benefit, because methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. <laughs>